Hello and welcome to this edition of the Entrepreneurship Through Acquisition podcast brought to you by the Polsky Center for Entrepreneurship at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. I'm Brian O'Connor, Adjunct Professor of Entrepreneurship at Chicago Booth. And joining me today, I have the pleasure of uh, sitting next to Brad Moorhead, Adjunct Professor of Entrepreneurship at Kellogg School of Management, CEO of LiveWatch Security, and Investment Committee member at NextGen Growth Partners. Brad, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me, Brian. Really looking forward to it. Yeah, great. Well, I think um, you know, if we could start, maybe I, I think our viewers and listeners would love to hear a little bit about your background and your story and your path toward entrepreneurship through acquisition. Yeah, so for me, the path was through finance and uh, starting off being an investment banking analyst at Goldman uh, in New York with their FIG group. Uh, while I was there, it was a great experience to see a lot of different companies. But what I always found is I was more drawn to the entrepreneurs. I was more drawn to the stories that they were telling about how they started their business, how they were, you know, sleeping in their car to get a sale, how they were in there and they were, you know, making up uh, things on the fly to try and get the the business. And so I wanted to move more that direction from banking and went to private equity uh, with a firm in San Francisco called Friedman Fleischer and Lowe. A uh, great experience there, which uh, again got to see a lot of different companies, but still was more intrigued by the entrepreneurs and the operators that were really growing those businesses. Um, so I had a unique opportunity to uh, get some operating experience while I was there, uh, enjoyed that. So then when I came back to grad school, um, I really just focused on entrepreneurship and uh, operating and, and managing businesses, or at least learning how to. And then from there um, was CFO of a business that was recently acquired by another alumni, uh, alumnus. Uh, and so helped grow that business called Feldco, uh, a replacement window company. Not a business I ever thought I would be in, right? If you had asked me growing up, Brad, what do you want to be when you grow up? Uh, re vinyl replacement windows wasn't something I ever would have said. But that was, was second to astronaut. Exactly, yeah. right, yeah. exactly. Between astronaut and fireman, <laughs> right? Um, no, but it, it was a great experience. He had acquired the business uh, a few years earlier, and so I got to really come in almost like an apprentice uh, to learn how to grow the business, bring my finance skills, which the business was in need of, and did that for about five years to grow it, and then had the opportunity to go buy my own business and really move from the apprentice role into the uh, uh, the role of, of CEO and doing it on my own. So some of those experiences um, as an investment banker, as a private equity investment professional, as a CFO of a small business, um, were undoubtedly formative in your entrepreneurship through acquisition path. If you could give us a, a snapshot into maybe uh, one or two or a handful of those things that you picked up along the way in those various roles um, and as they applied to your path, how, yeah. what, what would those be? Yeah, you know, when you're, when you're an investment banking analyst or when you're a private equity associate or VP, what, what have you, you know, you, you put together the spreadsheet and you put together maybe a, a nice looking PowerPoint deck on how things are supposed to work and uh, then you sit in a meeting and say, hey, here's the strategic plan. Right, and then somebody raises some questions. You go back to the spreadsheet. You tweak it a little bit. You say, "Okay, that's good. All right, we're done here." Right? You come back next quarter, and hopefully, uh, the management team has hit the plan. Um, when I moved into the operating role as CFO at Feldco, then CEO at LiveWatch, right? You realize there's a lot of work that has to happen between those different uh, PowerPoint decks and those quarterly board meetings, and, and that was great for me to have the opportunity to do it as CFO at, at Feldco. Right? It was really like having. I mean, we were partners, right? And uh, I think having a partner there, having a mentor that I could learn from where I was you know, shoulder to shoulder with him uh, helped me a lot to understand all that happened from uh, board meeting to board meeting and quarter to quarter. Um, so it was, it was a great experience to see that and really to understand the, the link, and I talk about this a lot in my classes, the, the link between that strategy that happens on an annual or quarterly basis and the execution that happens on a daily, hourly, minute by minute basis is people. Right? And it's the people on the operating and executive team, and it's the, the employees and partners and team members that you have. And how are you going to motivate them? So the, the big change for me was understanding you know, how do we go from a, a small three to five person deal team that's working on something uh, to managing hundreds of employees that have lots of different interests than your typical investment banker or private equity uh, professional. Sure, and I, I look forward to getting into some of the, the stories and your experience in managing people and the team and, and the things that you did at LiveWatch. Before we go there, what can you tell us about 
your unique ETA path? Because as I understand it, um, it's a little bit different than uh, some of the folks that might be considering raising a search fund or conducting a, uh, a self-funded search or even partnering up with a private equity fund. Um, what was your path and how, does it, how did it um, sort of shape the way you thought about uh, your experience at LiveWatch? Yep. You know, one thing that we talk about in my class is if you look at ser successful serial entrepreneurs, they tend to have three characteristics. Um, one, they have some capital. Uh, two, they have a mindset around risk where they don't seek risk, they actually look to mitigate risk more. And then the third is they have a strong mentor. Right? So as I was starting off kind of my process of looking for, uh, for my uh, entrepreneurial path, well, I, I didn't have any capital of my own, so I was going to have to find another way to get it. Um, I, I was more, I thought I was more risk averse. And what I came to find out about my risk mindset, that sort of second point, is that I, I wasn't actually totally risk averse. I didn't want zero risk, but I also wasn't a risk seeking individual that could throw all caution to the wind, start up a business out of their basement, eat ramen for a few years and, and uh, try and make it happen. I, I actually had a wife at the time and we wanted to have a family and we, we liked having a little bit of income. So. Uh, I wasn't totally risk averse, but I wasn't totally um, risk seeking, and so it was more about mitigating risk. But the big thing that changed for me was finding a mentor, and it was actually a series of mentors. It was through uh, a couple of professors at uh, grad school at Kellogg who made a connection with me to Doug, who had just acquired the business at Feldco, and he became that mentor. He became that uh, sort of apprentice relationship. And actually, uh, I worked on an independent study project for this professor, uh, this entrepreneurship professor, which was for Doug's company. And at the end of that presentation, uh, Doug kind of chased me out of the room and said, hey, Brad, this presentation is great. You, you did a wonderful job on this independent study. Thank you so much. Why don't you put your money where your mouth is and actually come implement this plan with me at my company? Uh, and, and I was thinking to myself, you know, Doug, that was just a school assignment. That wasn't real, right? I'm not actually going to do this, right? What are you talking about? That was just for a grade. Uh, but he was serious. And uh, he said, no, I, I really want you to come do this. And it took me a while to really make that jump because I was dead set on going and doing my own thing right out of the gates just to start off uh, as, as my, own, you know, my own boss with my own company. Um, but I had a couple other conversations with some of my mentors, going back to this mentorship point. They said, Brad, you're getting the opportunity to learn from someone who's already acquired a business, which is what you want to do. Um, you're getting the opportunity to learn how to actually run a business from someone who has already started to grow and run a business successfully. And you're getting, getting, going to get an opportunity to learn from someone who has such a complementary set of skills around sales and marketing and leadership with your finance skills that you're going to grow your skill set pretty quickly. So I went back to Doug and said, uh, Doug, you know, I really wanted to do my own thing, um, but I, I've talked to a few people. I really would love uh, to learn more about what you're doing. Um, but if this goes well, I'd like, you know, in a few years to be able to go buy my own business. He said, absolutely. If you come in and you help me grow this business and you help us take it to the next level and implement this plan in five years, I'll help you buy your own business, start your own business, what have you. And that's kind of how it played out. And, and, and then at, at that day, Doug Cook became your mentor. Right. <clears throat> Tell us a little bit about how that relationship with, with Doug Cook evolved over time. I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, we, uh, we tend to use sort of loosely and lightly this, this term of, of mentor. Yeah. Um, tell us about that relationship and the various accountabilities and the various uh, things that you and Doug agreed to uh, as it relates to the working relationship that you had with him in Feldco and his sort of commitment back to you as a mentee. Yeah. You know, it, it started as a relationship where Doug was hiring me in as his CFO, right? I mean, he really was my boss. And then I remember about two years in was the first time he really introduced me uh, instead of as his CFO, he introduced me as his partner. And that was a, a very cool moment for me because it showed that our relationship had sort of gone to that next level. And then obviously over time, uh, he was an investor into LiveWatch and was uh, on the board there and, and uh, our sort of unofficial board. And that was a great relationship as the uh, relationship evolved again. And then it evolved into really what is now you know a friendship and a mentorship. Um, but I, I think the big thing when I see students and, and young alumni that are coming out of school and I talk to them about this mentor component, 
uh, they see it as more of a one-sided street. What can I get? Too often they see it as a one-sided street of what can I get from a potential mentor? When in fact, the most successful relationships I've seen around mentors, it's more about what can I give to that mentor, right? And if you focus in, in those interactions on what can I give? Hey, Doug, you have a company. There's a plan to grow that business. How can we grow it faster? I want to give my time, my skills to help you do that. Right? Then you create some reciprocity there where hopefully, if you have the right mentor, then they want to help you do it in the future. So I, I think a lot of finding the right mentor is focusing on how can I be a great mentee to that mentor? How can I follow? How can I uh, really practice good followership? Because in a lot of cases, good followership leads to really good leadership. Yeah, so it's, it's a two-way street. Mm -hmm. So um, shifting gears a little bit, uh, you, you, you spent time sort of as an apprentice to Doug uh, as the CFO of Felco. Um, tell us a little bit about your search for, that ultimately led you to LiveWatch Security. Were you yeah. focused on um, uh, specifically on, on the security industry? What was it that drew you to LiveWatch as an acquisition? And how did you ultimately source it? Yeah. So I started looking around at a lot of different industries, I think as a lot of people do, you know, but I really tried to keep focus in my search. Um, so I was about five years in of working with Doug and uh, then hired a, I hired uh, a business broker uh, to help me on the buy side. It was very directed, right? Given my skill set from banking and private equity, we were able to work very efficiently together. But at any given time, I tried to never have more than about three to four industries where I was really looking for a business because I wanted to get to know those industries. And then I'd have sort of a, a, a secondary list and then as industries fell off, I'd replace it with something from the secondary list. So security wasn't even on my initial list of industries to look at, um, but there were qualities there that had it in the overall you know, A, B, C list of industries that I was, I was thinking about uh, going after. Recurring revenue, um, relatively low risk uh, because of the structure of the industry uh, and then also some disruptive change that was happening to the space. And it was really then during my search uh, as a couple other industries rolled off around some healthcare things, some B2B services that I was considering and then I, I was at my house and I was actually installing a component, uh, a smart home component on my house and I said you know I should go back and look at security because there has to be a better way to do this. And as I revisited it, um, I found that there was some disruptive change happening in the industry. So I, I think anytime that you can find uh, recurring revenue and you can find also some disruptive change that's happening at least to an, a segment of the industry, it presents an opportunity to grow after that, sure. go after that. And if yeah. it's a growing segment of the industry, uh, like ours was in the do-it-yourself wireless home security component, uh, then there's a, a ton of opportunity. So, so at that point, you identified a, an issue in the industry as a consumer. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you mentioned getting up to speed and becoming credible in the industry. Um, give us some examples of how you did that. Did you uh, find a river guide? Uh, was, was potentially your buy side business broker very well versed in the security services space? Did you attend a number of trade shows? How did you think about getting up to speed? Yes, right, yeah, all of the above. So um, I actually found another business broker that was just focused on that particular vertical, right? And what was interesting about that, it was a sell side broker just in the home security and uh, commercial security vertical, right? So he had a big listing of a bunch of different deals. Um, I had credibility in part because of my uh, time with Doug, time with Feldco, but also the banking and private equity experience. So I had enough credibility, I could go to one of these, buy, these sell side brokers in this particular industry. And I could say, hey, let me see your deals. And it was a quick way to get me up to speed um, on that industry in a very, very efficient manner. So I think finding uh, business brokers that are very specialized in a vertical that you're interested in is a great way to go to get up to speed very quickly and efficiently on that space. So I had my generalist broker that was my buy side guy. I then had several sell side mm -hmm. um, brokers that were focused on specific verticals. Uh, then I went to trade shows and, you know, kissed a lot of frogs, right? Uh, went and put in quite a few LOIs. My first meeting um, with one of the companies I ended up acquiring, because I acquired two companies for very different reasons and very different profiles. One was a very small business that gave me the licensing I needed. It was based in Milwaukee. Two weeks later, I acquired the True Platform Company, which was based in Kansas. 
and uh, it was the do-it-yourself wireless security company that uh, I wanted to buy. So that's a great segue into um, understanding a little bit about you transitioning into the CEO role. Mm -hmm. So uh, you'd never run a security services right. business before. Um, you're trying to manage organizations that uh, coexist in Milwaukee and in Kansas. Um, how did you uh, think about that role for you, the CEO role, and what were some of the challenges associated with being a uh, a, a relatively young and first-time CEO of, of two really small organizations. You know, I, I think for me as I was coming in, I, I had the benefit of having some operating experience um, from Feltco, and that definitely helped a lot. Maybe not for what I would know, but it, it helped a lot to show me how much I didn't know. I think a lot of people coming out of banking, coming out of private equity, you, you know a lot, and you know a lot about a lot of different companies. But there are all these things the, that are the unknown unknowns, right? The things you don't even know that you don't know. And I at least had a little more visibility into that. And it had also helped me at Feltco kind of put, check my ego and put my ego aside, right? Hey, Brad, you've done this in New York. You've done this in San Francisco. That doesn't mean squat when we're trying to sell home security systems on the internet out of an operation in Kansas and Milwaukee. And, and I think kind of checking my ego there and really understanding, hey, well, there are some employees here that probably need to be changed out, right? There are some employees here that are also really amazing, right? And they just might be uh, people that haven't had as much exposure as you've had through uh, Booth and Kellogg and uh, different work experiences. So I went in very much with an open mind and the idea that I'm going to understand before being understood. I want to see what do we have, right? What are we doing well? What really are our core strengths? And a big part of that, once we understood that um, from what the company already has, is what's the culture that we're going to build? And I think especially in the type of company where we were, B2C, a lot of employees, a lot of entry level employees, you have to have a culture. Culture becomes the catalyst that propels your growth. How much of that culture existed before your acquisition versus how much did you want to change or implement yourself? Yeah, I, I think the culture was there, right? It came from uh, the, the leader there, Chris, um, that I acquired, the, he was one of the owners that I acquired the business from. There was a, the component, sort of the raw materials, the ingredients were already there, but working with Chris, then hiring my CFO actually right out of, uh, right out of graduate school, right out of business school, um, we were able to put it together in a little different way. And we've got some other people on the management team. We were able to combine those ingredients maybe in a, a slightly different way and really talk about the culture and build it into our culture. And that's when our growth really started to take off. Yeah, so you, you step into this culture. Maybe it shifts a little bit based on your style and your approach. Um, what about the people? Uh, maybe, did you, did you face any unforeseen headwinds? And did you face any challenges associated with being a relatively young new kid on the block? Yeah, yeah, definitely, right? You, you have, um, in some cases, you might be uh, leading and managing people that are very different than you, have very different goals, maybe different age, different backgrounds, right? And you have to do your best, I think, in a lot of those cases to put yourself in their shoes and understand what motivates them. Coming from banking, coming from private equity, about, I don't know, 99.9% .9 of the people in those fields are motivated by money and are willing to work any amount of time to get the job done. You step into a different industry and all of a sudden, people may not be money motivated, right? They may not be willing to work as much time. They might punch the clock at nine and want to go home at you know four, even when they're supposed to stay till five. So you have to understand what motivates them. We changed a lot of the motivations. We changed a lot of the compensation systems. Uh, we changed different other reward systems that were not, that were more intrinsic uh, around their motivation. And uh, there were a lot of differences there where we really had to understand our employee base. Uh, and in a lot of cases, you know, some of the things I would have tried coming from banking, well, hey, let's just pay people more to do more, right? Well, didn't work because people weren't money motivated. So, Brad, tell us a little bit about the transition into the executive office. Maybe give us an anecdote um, about, you know, our viewers and listeners would love to hear a little bit about something that they might expect when taking the executive office for the first time. Right. So what's interesting, especially about the sort of ETA path, right, you're going through your search, you're looking for businesses, right, then all of a sudden you find one, right? You, you get the LOI, you get the deal signed, it closes, 
And then all of a sudden, the next day at noon or midnight or whatever your attorney put down as the time, you own that business, right? So for you, you're stepping into this brand new seat, you have a brand new job and you're walking in and you want to you know, give a rah-rah speech or you want to get people fired up. All these people that are at the company, they're super nervous about you. They may have seen you walking around, they may have had some conversations with you in due diligence, but now you're the boss. And I remember uh, I went in uh, and, and had a conversation. We were gonna have a big town hall meeting for that, that first day. And uh, I went in, I'm fired up. But for all these other people, right? Even though it's my first day for them, this is day number, you know, 737 or something, right? And they want to understand what does it mean to them as opposed to me talking about what it means to me. And as we uh, kind of wrapped up the meeting, and it went fine, but we got out of the uh, meeting, we're walking away, and my partner Chris, who was one of the uh, the president of the company, who transitioned into my management team, my executive team, and like I said, it's now my partner. Chris came up to me and said, "Hey, hey can we talk?" Yeah, sure, right, I'm fired up, I have all this adrenaline going. And so we go in his office and uh, he goes, uh, you know, how'd you think it went? And I'm like, you know, Chris is about my age, right? We're about the same age, so. Uh, I go, you know, I, I think I probably could have done a better job with this, better job with that. And he's like, you know, I, I, I think uh, it went really well. I think that was great. But in the future, right, I think this, 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 and this, and you may want to have me help you out a little bit because they've known me for years and they are really here, as I figured it out, working for him. He was the heart sure. and soul of the organization. So for me to come in all of a sudden, am I trying to replace the heart and soul of the organization with something new, do a heart transplant here in the middle of like day one? And I wasn't, right? What I loved and one of the reasons I bought the business is because of Chris and because of the ingredients for the culture that he already had. So it was almost counterintuitive that the reason I liked the business and wanted to buy it so much was because of Chris, yet I was almost displacing him on that yeah. first day. So, so could you have maybe um, co-managed that, that process, or that town hall meeting? Would that Ab have maybe led to a better buy-in and outcome on that initial interaction with your team? Absolutely. And, and I'm not saying that's right for every business. I think every business is different. If you have a you know, dysfunctional management team you're buying from, then you're probably going to take different steps. If it's a turnaround, it's different. But that's what I'm saying about know your audience, know you know the culture, know those ingredients. But after that meeting, Chris and I, our relationship changed. And I really started to think of him as the heart and soul of the organization. And that's a positive, not a negative. Check my ego at the door and let him do the rah-rah meetings. Because frankly, he's better at it than I am. And, and that helped us build the culture even faster because he already had that trust. And I was able to build the trust with me from the trust that Chris had already created for him. This notion of checking your ego at the door and, and humility and a humble sort of presence and, and you know, demeanor about approaching your role as the CEO in, this, in, in the business continues to come up yeah. in all of the conversations that we have. <laughs> um, it's so critically important. What, um, what did you do, uh, you know, as a first time CEO, it might be easy to not have that sort of woven into your approach. How did you use perhaps Doug and other advisors or board members around you to help you sort of realize that that was the right path? And, and was it driven by them? Yeah, you know, in my last few experiences, what I've found is the employees, they may care about the company, but what they really care about is their particular job, right? They care about what they're doing, at least if they're good employees that you want to keep on at the, at the business. And if you can go in and find a way to get a quick win, if you can find a way to get a small victory for them, right? if they're doing something that you can say, yeah, why are we doing that? Oh, really? Well, we don't need to really do that anymore. Let's do these other things that are super productive and you just save them an hour of time. Or maybe you change something in the compensation plan that benefits them, or maybe you add some benefits to the, uh, to the benefits plan that they care about. But learning about them, learning about what motivates them is huge and then looking for those small wins. Where can you build credibility through small wins? And it doesn't come from sitting at the whiteboard, and it doesn't come from the rah-rah speech. It really comes, in my opinion, from rolling up your sleeves and building those quick wins, those small victories, those singles and doubles, not the home runs and not the rah-rah speeches. 
something that might feel relatively insignificant to you. Right. I mean, we, we, we talk about this in our course at, at, at Booth, which is um, how can you create buy-in buy and further advance the culture by uh, creating small wins that are, that are employee-facing that have immediate and tangible benefit to your employee base. I think, I think that's right. Absolutely, and, and they're not always what you might consider classically positive things. In some cases, it's firing someone. Right? You know, we had somebody in one part of the organization that was truly toxic to the culture, right? Had a meeting, introduced ourselves, kept going, talked about the goals for the business. This one person clearly wasn't on board and was clearly toxic to the culture, fired him the next day. You know, everyone then came in that next day and you still have to deal with some of the aftermath of that and they're like, oh, well, you know, what's going on? Does that mean the rest of us? No, right? This is why he wasn't the right fit. Then you can feel this sort of sense of relief. So. There are the positive things that you can do for people, make their lives easier, make their jobs more efficient, uh, have fun at work, right? I, I love having shared experiences and, and creating memories and building up the culture that way. But it's also about eliminating the negatives, not just enhancing some of the positives. And sometimes the negatives are people and you have to, you can have one bad apple that ruins the bunch and you gotta get rid of the bad apples too. Can, can you give us an example of, of this notion of creating fun at work and, and maybe a, a, an example or two of how you did that at Livewatch and how that created sort of a, a, a culture and, and um, rallying around the same goals and objectives? Yeah, w one thing I love to do is create shared experiences, shared memories, right? We've sent, um, large numbers of employees to the World Series. When Kansas City was playing in the World Series, we sent our Kansas City employees, uh, Kansas employees to the World Series. We've sent people to Cubs games, rooftops, uh, football games. We, it's not just sports, we've sent them on vacations, we have taken them to fun places that they never would have been able to do on their own, right? And part of that is, is our culture. When people come to work, we expect them to have very candid, very tough, very honest conversations, right? Well, you can't do that without also having positive stuff on the other side, right? You have to have some positive energy to draw from so that when I come into work in whatever position I'm in and I say, hey, Brian, uh, this customer's upset because this, this, and this didn't happen because you didn't do what you were supposed to do. I need that to get better or you can't be on the team. I, I can't have those tough conversations and candid conversations, at least in my opinion and in the culture we've created, without also having positive expense, experiences that we can share from and draw from to say, hey, you know what, Brad's not a jerk because he had a tough conversation. I went to a baseball game with Brad, he was a lot of fun, so I know he's not a jerk, and if he's not a jerk and he's a pretty fair guy and he's this ticked off at me because these things happen, I know he must be really mad and he must have a good reason. To this do. might be something I should pay attention to. Right. And, and, and we should work through. Right. Uh, otherwise, it's too easy for people to just think, oh, you know, Brad's a jerk. Or, you know, you got to balance it out, right? You don't want it to be Brad's a softy and a super nice guy. But we really pride ourselves on candid, open, honest communication. Because in an, a small company, in an entrepreneurial environment, you do not have the time or the financial resources to be inefficient. You have to be able, to, you can't beat around the bush, you can't have a bunch of meetings about meetings about meetings to finally make a decision. You gotta get in that meeting and 20 minutes figure out what's the root cause of the issue, what are we gonna do to fix it, what are we gonna do to prevent it from ever happening again? Brad, that's, that's, that's all very good advice, it's wonderful. So can, you, can you share, um, maybe with the last few minutes that we have, um, one piece of advice or feedback that you might give uh, our viewers and listeners uh, that might be contemplating going down this path, and, and, and maybe even more specifically, the folks that are uh, thinking about transitioning into the executive office for the first time? Mm -hmm. You know, after the deal, the, uh, after we sold Livewatch, and it was you know, a very successful deal, um, I made a call, I think, uh, to my parents, thanked my parents, right? Uh, thanked Doug, who was my mentor, that was probably my second call, and the third call went back to that professor who actually was the mentor that helped me um, really change my life. And that's what I told him, I said, I want you to know you altered the trajectory of my life by showing me that a path that may have seemed a little risky or may have seemed a little harder than the traditional uh, grad school, you know, post-grad uh, path, actually wasn't that risky and actually was what I needed to do. And, and I truly thanked him for that. And I think, you know, as I've now thought about things I want to do in the future, I want to help, right? That's why I go back and I teach at Kellogg. That's why I do some of the guest lecturing. 
That's why I believe in uh, you know, next-gen partners and, and what they're doing to create infrastructure around entrepreneurship through acquisition to make it easier, more efficient, um, and, and hopefully more profitable for everyone uh, that, that should to get into this path. And, and I think properly assessing those risks so you can understand you know, what really is a risk and what isn't uh, is what that professor helped me do to find a mentor to really alter the trajectory of, of my life and my family's life for the better. Yep, great. Brad Moorhead, thank you very Thanks. much for joining us. Thank you to our viewers and listeners for joining this edition of the Entrepreneurship Through Acquisition podcast brought to you by Polsky Center for Entrepreneurship at Chicago Booth.